Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, where I cover the latest Starship news, space launch updates, and all the other cool events that happened over the past seven days. Last week was a busy one. SpaceX are preparing the catch arms for their historic catch attempt of Booster 12. Ship 30 received its decals. Falcon 9 made several outings. The ISS received a new resupply mission. China launched Long March 4B from a brand new launch location. And liquid water was discovered on Mars. All of this and so much more. So settle back and enjoy. It's all coming together. SpaceX recently posted that both the Flight 5 ship and Super Heavy are ready to launch pending regulatory approval, and we've seen further evidence of this last week in the form of Ship 30 receiving its decals, proudly displaying Ship 30 on its nose, though with apparent absence of the SpaceX X logo that we've seen on previous vehicles with decals. This shot really highlights the additional heat shielding around the flap hinges. Note how much we can see in the corner here, which has been buffed after we saw what happened to the same spot on Ship 29. Funnily enough, Ship 29 didn't receive S-29 decals for some reason. Whatever the reason was, I'm glad to see the decals return for Flight 5. Flight 6 will feature Ship 31. Now, like Ship 30, its heat shield was designed and installed before Flight 4, and we know now that it's inadequate, and so it, like Ship 30 was, is now covered in scaffolding as crews begin the lengthy process of replacing every single tile in preparation for its re-entry attempt. The re-entry of Ship 29 stole the show for Flight 4, but Flight 5's biggest moment is undoubtedly going to be the landing of Super Heavy, which SpaceX are aiming to have land in the catch arms of the launch tower, and then rest it back into the launch mount, hypothetically able to launch right away again. We've seen quite a bit of work on the arms in preparation for this, with reinforcement bumper pads, and most recently, we've seen booster prototype 14.1 reinstalled in the launch mount for catch tests. We saw a variety of tests being conducted over the following days, with the chopsticks moving around the test article itself and above it. Presumably SpaceX here are testing how quickly the arms can position and reposition themselves in anticipation for a descending booster and how accurately they can respond to slight changes in trajectory. Some of the tests involved drones, like this one, to give SpaceX engineers a closer look at the catch points. Towards the end of the week, the booster test tank was removed from the pad and returned to the production site. Whether or not SpaceX have any further plans for this test article remains to be seen. The departure of Booster 14.1 didn't stop SpaceX from continuing work on the chopsticks though. We saw some minor movement of the arms on Sunday, with crews positioned in cherry pickers between the arms, and we saw apparent calibration assessment of the landing rails. These move up and down to cushion the impact of the booster making contact with the arms, and the crews appeared to be taking measurements between raising and lowering of the rails. Most recently, we've seen the black paint being stripped in specific locations on the vertical supports of the arms, which seem to be along the weld points. Earlier today, these were then covered with weld doubler plates to reinforce the joints in the structure and make it stronger and more resilient to breaking under the force of a booster catch. SpaceX therefore taking this very seriously and it's very exciting to see this actually all move forward. Now that's all launch Tower 1, and while Tower 2 is still under construction, it's rising at remarkable pace. After a brief hiatus in construction to allow teams to reconfigure the CC8800 crane to allow it to keep stacking, the stacking of modules has resumed. We saw the addition of module number 7, shortly followed by the stacking of module 8. And there the tower stands, awaiting the installation of its expected final module, module 9, after which it will stand at full height. SpaceX transported this module to the launch pad in the very early hours of today, and it does indeed look like the tower's top. It only feels like yesterday when SpaceX started breaking ground for this tower, so it's amazing how fast they've built it. Everyone's least favourite starship, Ship 26, may finally be meeting its end. This weird, flapless starship was always a bit of an enigma. At the time it first rolled out, it was speculated that flapless ships would be used so SpaceX could just focus their efforts on booster recovery first, with second stage recovery later. Or they were a quick and dirty way of launching Starlink V2 while the recoverable ships were still being worked on. It then served as the first test subject for the Massey's Test Facility's static fire stand, presumably because at this stage SpaceX had no intention of launching it and didn't want to risk damaging a real flight article when testing the stand. But now, it's unlikely this vehicle can serve any further purpose, and as such, last week we saw SpaceX move it from its place in the Rocket Garden and into Mega Bay 2. 
It was then lifted by the bridge crane and workers set about removing all of its Raptor engines. After all of this was done, it was returned to the rocket garden, where it's presumably now awaiting final scrapping. Goodbye, Ship 26. You were weird. <laughs> You know, speaking of weird, look at this tin can man head shaped looking thing moving around the production yard. This is a new methane header tank for Starship Ship 34. 3D artist Chameleon Circuit shared this render on Twitter, showing how this will be positioned inside the Starship nose cone. Test Tank 16 has been sat in storage in the Star Factory building following cage testing at Massey's, but it looks like SpaceX aren't done with it yet, as it was rolled out of the factory on Saturday and returned to the Massey site for further testing. Earlier today, it was lifted into the test cage. SpaceX's Falcon 9 was once again flying multiple times throughout the week. Monday saw a Starlink mission from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy successfully place 23 satellites to Starlink Shell 10, and successful first stage booster landing followed second stage separation. The same day as this, on the west coast, another Falcon 9 lifted off from Vandenberg, delivering two telecommunication satellites into a Molniya orbit, a type of highly elliptical Earth orbit. The satellites were the result of a joint effort between Space Norway, the US Space Force, and the British telecommunications company Inmarsat. Meanwhile, the Falcon 9 first stage for this mission successfully landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, achieving an impressive 20 second landing overall. Another Falcon 9 launched on Thursday, carrying two Earth observation satellites to low Earth orbit from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40. These were the Worldview Legion 3 and 4, built by American company Maxar Technologies. As the names suggest, these are the third and fourth satellites to join the Worldview Legion imaging constellation that will provide high resolution imaging for commercial and military applications. Falcon 9's first stage landed on Landing Zone 1 at Cape Canaveral following stage separation, wrapping up this booster's 16th overall flight. The third Falcon 9 mission of the week was Friday's Transporter 11 mission. The Transporter missions are SpaceX's dedicated smallsat rideshare missions, and this launch had 116 spacecraft on board as it lifted off from Space Launch Complex 4E at Vandenberg. One of these payloads was the Gain-de-Sat 1A, an Earth observation CubeSat and the first ever Senegalese satellite. There was quite a variety of other payloads, from Internet of Things satellites, research sats, technology demonstrators, signals intelligence payloads, and amateur radio, to name a few. We were also treated to another return to land Falcon 9 landing, as the first stage booster had enough fuel remaining to return all the way back to landing zone 4. India launched a mission last week. Now, they always copyright claim videos that use their footage, so I'll have to obfuscate the footage in some way, so sorry. This launch was on Friday though, and saw India's small satellite launch vehicle rocket carry an Earth observation satellite to low Earth orbit. China launched nine Yaogun 43-01 reconnaissance satellites to low Earth orbit last week. These were carried by a Long March 4B, which, for the first time, launched from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center. Normally, this rocket operates from Launch Complex 1 at the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket also sported a new, wider payload fairing for this mission. Last Thursday, saw a Soyuz 2.1A launch the Progress MS-28 mission from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Progress spacecraft are Russia's resupply vehicles for the International Space Station, and this time it carried 2,621 kilograms of food, fuel, and supplies for the Expedition 71 and Starliner crew, docking to the aft port of the Zvezda service module after a two-day journey to the station. We've known that there is frozen water at the poles of Mars and evidence of water vapor in its atmosphere, but so far we've never found liquid water. Until now. NASA's InSight lander has been on the Martian surface since 2018, and among its various instruments is a seismometer, which over the mission's four-year duration steadily measured the seismic activity from deep within the planet's interior, recording over 1,319 quakes in all. Scientists have concluded that, after analyzing the quakes and vibrations, the lander has detected seismic signals of liquid water, specifically large reservoirs of water at depths of around 10 to 20 kilometers within the Martian crust. So it's going to be a long time, if ever, we manage to reach those depths to see if these reservoirs could harbor life. But at least we now have one more target in our ongoing search for life beyond Earth. 
Lion Aerospace was back in business last week, I thought I'd give the Kerbal Space Program mod Planetside Exploration Technologies by Benji10 a spin. This is an amazing mod that adds a ton of surface based parts like wind turbines, rover parts, big solar panels, and of course awesome habitat and crew modules. And I used it to build a MUN base. I had a lot of fun with this video, so check it out if that sounds interesting, but otherwise that wraps up today's episode of Space this week. I do hope you enjoyed the video. Sign up to my Patreon if you can help support what I do here. And uh, yes, that's the end now. Goodbye.